Good morning. Um, so, I mean, I so I have a session. Um, it is um, I'm going to go over kind of the process of how we've updated the Drupal Code of Conduct uh, over the last year. Um, it is I have a few very dense slides. So, if I am going too fast, if I'm like doing too much info dumping, feel free to like raise your hand and slow me down a little bit. Um, you know, I also want to be respectful of folks' time and everything here and, and make sure we leave time for some Q&A and discussion afterward. So, um, yeah, so as I'm going through, if you're like, George, slow it down, just, just shoot up a hand and, uh, and then we should hopefully have some good time for Q&A at the end. So, yes, welcome to how we updated the Drupal Code of Conduct. Uh, I'm George Demet, um, so my day job is uh, founder and CEO of Palantir.net, uh, digital strategy design development consultancy uh, based outside of Chicago, but with people all over the US. Um, so I've been active in the Drupal community since uh, 07. Uh, the first uh, Drupal event I attended was the uh, uh, Open Source CMS Summit uh, at the Yahoo campus in Sunnyvale. Uh, so that was back when Yahoo had a campus. So it gives you a sense of how long ago it was. But, uh, you know, really small, amazing kind of opportunity to meet so many people who have been so active in the community for so long and many of whom are, are continue to be active today. Um, so in terms of, of how I give back to the community, I'm, I'm not a coder, um, but uh, I do kind of know how to talk to people and listen to people. Uh, and so I've been, uh, so I was uh, one of the founding members of the uh, Drupal Community Working Groups Conflict Resolution Team, and I've got a slide that will kind of explain how all these different groups are and how they relate to each other. But what it essentially means is that between 2013 and 2021, uh, you know, when I stepped down, I um, was one of the folks responsible for uh, code of conduct enforcement, uh, conflict mediation, resolution, um, things of that nature. Um, you know, as one of the founding members, we, we learned a lot. We uh, built up a lot of processes along the way. We made mistakes uh, and uh, learned from them. And... Uh, really try to document and, and bring that knowledge into our, you know, how we move forward. So right now I'm a member of the uh, Drupal community health team, which means uh, that I don't, uh, I'm not involved in uh, conflict resolution or code of conduct issues unless I'm specifically called in either because I have background knowledge of the situation or some sort of specific expertise that would be useful. Um, and then, yeah, co-author of Drupal's Code of Conduct for events about 10 years ago, um, gosh, 11 years ago at this point, um, after uh, I was one of the co-chairs of DrupalCon Chicago in 2011, uh, we didn't have a Code of Conduct uh, for our events. We didn't have a Code of Conduct for DrupalCon. And as someone who was kind of sitting in the like organizer seat and hearing afterward about some of the things that happened um, at that event. Uh, fortunately, very few, but um, still it was like, you know what, we, we kind of need a code of conduct for events. And so um, went through that process and uh, uh, helped create the, the initial version of the document that exists today. And so I'll explain the difference again between the community code of conduct, which is what you see on drupal.org, and the code of conduct for an event like DrupalCon, an in-person event where you have people interacting with each other in person, right, or even virtually at events, and, uh, and sort of the, the differences between how that gets handled. So let me lay some context here. So <laughs> this, is, this is the best way I've found to visualize this. So um, in terms of community governance, the community working group, the way uh, we're set up, we have kind of a unique structure. Um, so starting at the bottom, uh, I mentioned the community health team. And so the community health team is a group of 
I believe about two to three dozen folks um, who are actively engaged in different aspects of the community from all over the project, whether they're folks who work on Drupal.org, whether they're folks who work on events, um, or uh, am ambassadors, people who are involved with communities in different parts of the world, uh, making sure that we have a, uh, a global representation. And, um, and again, as I said, you know, uh, they're in yellow, so that means, it's my little color coding, it means we don't get involved in uh, conflict resolution, uh, you know, between folks. Uh, if somebody files an incident report, that doesn't, the community health team doesn't see that. Um, but, um, but obviously may get involved uh, if there's, if there's something going on in an issue queue thread that's public, uh, sometimes one of our community health teams will be one of the folks who posts one of those little, we call them the little nudge messages that kind of reminds people to be respectful and everything. So that's a community health team. Um, then we have the subject matter experts. And so those are people who might be part of the community health team who might get called in on a particular conflict because there's, um, they have again, some sort of specific expertise, whether it's a specific language or cultural expertise, uh, whether it involves maybe uh, a particular subset of the community who that person, you know, uh, has a better knowledge of, things like that. And so that's why uh, that I have in blue. So that, may, that means that somebody who might sometime get pulled in on an incident report. Uh, and then you have the, the community working groups conflict resolution team. That's that kind of small core group, uh, usually around um, four to six people um, who are really actively involved. They receive the incident reports. Uh, and they are, um, they're the ones who work through them uh, and, you know, and basically try to resolve the situation or conflict in one way or the other. So, um, so again, the blue color coding, those are people who, who may be involved with, um, with issues. The uh, community working group has, uh, the, so they are overseen by the review panel. The review panel is three people, uh, consists of two community elected board members of the Drupal Association and an independent representative, uh, basically someone who's involved in community management uh, from a different open source project or involved with different open source projects. And so uh, that person is, uh, and, and actually has been since we put this governance structure in place in 2019, uh, John O'Bacon. Uh, so folks aren't familiar with him. He's kind of a big name in open source community management, wrote a couple books on it, all around pretty great guy, um, but very, very experienced with, with, with this stuff. So the review panel, um, their role would be if there is an issue that the community working group either needs some additional assistance on or if uh, somebody wants to appeal a decision of the community working group, that review panel would get involved in that point. The review panel also approves the membership of the community working group of that conflict resolution team. And so that's the oversight there. And this was a structure we put in place in uh, beginning of 2019. Um, and uh, previously, uh, the conflict resolution team had reported directly to Dries. Um, that wasn't something that scaled. It didn't work for anyone. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and Dries didn't want, uh, <laughs> want to be responsible for it either. Um, but, you know, at the time, the initial governance structures were set in place in 2013. He was kind of the only person who could do it. So, um, and because we have those community elected board members who are part of that, uh, who make up two thirds of that panel, it does mean that there is a level of accountability to the community at large. Uh, so then above, the, so, so I've got all of those folks that I've just talked about are bound by the Community Working Group's Code of Ethics. That's a document that we have. It's up on drupal.org. You can look at it. Um, but it basically says things like uh, if there is an incident report that gets filed uh, and, and you, are, you are part of working on that, like you don't, uh, keep it, you keep it confidential, uh, you, you know, don't, um, uh, you know, 
share the details of the incident or people's names. You, you protect uh, particularly the privacy of those who are making reports um, so that they are feel safe doing so. Uh, and, uh, and it also covers things like a conflict of interest, like how you recuse yourself if you have a connection to one of the involved parties in an incident, things like that. And again, that's something we put in place um, in uh, 2017, 2018, um, just as kind of an added uh, way of improving our accountability and governance. So then above that, obviously you have the Drupal Association Board of Directors, um, and uh, so that includes the two community elected board members plus, I think there's 12, 13 other, I'm looking over at Leslie because she, <laughs> roughly in there. Uh, uh, and those are obviously the folks who oversee uh, the, the running of the Drupal Association. They're, they're really more of a strategic board, uh, so they, they don't get involved in operations. That's, that's the CEO, Tim Doyle manages that. Um, and there is, if something can, in theory, like get escalated, if it has such a huge community-wide impact that, um, you know, the review panel feels that the entire board needs to be looped in on it, that, uh, that can happen. Um, it has never happened. Um, the, the kind of incident that that would necessitate that would be, I would think, pretty extreme. And there's also kind of language in our charter about, about how that gets handled, again, to make sure that we are, uh, we are protecting people's uh, privacy and everything. So that's it's a little bit of context, kind of laying out our structure, because it is a little bit different uh, than other open source projects. Uh, we're a little bit different than many open source projects, because we are uh, you know, an independent project. We don't have, we're not corporate sponsored. A corporate project can basically has their HR department handle a lot of these things, but uh, we have our own structure. Um, so the, uh, I, so I mentioned before, there's, there's the event code. So there's a code of conduct for this event that is enforced and managed by the Drupal Association staff. Uh, so these folks are generally not involved unless they're looped in on the issue. Uh, local uh, community events, Drupal camps, et cetera, again, have their own codes of conduct. They have their own enforcement. Um, if there is an incident that happens at a camp, we really want to make sure that, you know, uh, we encourage camp organizers to let the community working group know um, of that what happened because sometimes what you'll see is you might have somebody who um, we've seen situations where there's somebody who kind of has a pattern of behavior at different in-person events, and uh, and if the CWG knows about it, then they can uh, take appropriate action to make sure that harm doesn't occur at other events. All right, that's a whole lot of context. Um, <laughs> more context now. <laughs> so here's a kind of a brief history, and this is how we got to this point. So Drupal actually was one of the very like a very early project in terms of adopting a, a code of conduct, and it was back in 2010. Moshe Weitzman, who I think is like number, he's in the number three or four, he's in the top 10 Drupal.org numbers, been with the project for an incredibly long time since the start. Um, he proposed in 2010 that we essentially adopt the Ubuntu code of conduct, uh, which we which we did. There was you know a very short discussion and, and everyone was like, yep, that sounds like a great idea. Um, but it, um, when it was adopted, there, there, was no, uh, there was no enforcement mechanism, there was no language around what to do if there's conflict. It was really just kind of a, well, we'll, we'll put that in when we get there. And uh, so, uh, you know, what happened during that time and, you know, again, finding out about this uh, later is that, you know, there was obviously still harassment and bad things happening and people um, leaving the project um, and because they didn't know who they could talk to or what could be done about it. Uh, so in 2012, summer 2012, uh, Dries held a governance sprint and it was really uh, to put together some governance structures uh, around both the technical direction of the project and the community uh, so there were, there were several working groups created. Uh, the community working group was one of them. Um, 
And as I mentioned before, this is around the time as well when the Drupal Association adopted their code of conduct for DrupalCon and other events. So then CWG was chartered in the spring of 2013, uh, kind of first order of business after kind of sorting through some of the outstanding things we were aware of was to develop incident report and conflict resolution process. We added some anti-harassment language to the code of conduct, but it, it was again, very general. It was like, we don't tolerate harassment, but we didn't really kind of go into what that meant. But at least if somebody experienced harassment, they had a place to report it. Uh, they had a way to report it, and that was in the Code of Conduct. And we, we uh, kind of continued along with that until uh, 2017. Um, there was uh, kind of a major community incident that occurred in 2017. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but the, up, the result of that was that there were a series of community conversations that happened starting at DrupalCon, uh, and then a few others that were uh, held uh, over the summer of 2017, uh, facilitated by Whitney Hess, who's kind of this amazing coach. Um, and, uh, and then there were also an additional kind of, there were some surveys, there was some stuff that went out really around community governance because there was a kind of a widespread recognition that something needed to be done. Out of that uh, came several series of proposals to improve uh, community governance. Uh, there, a lot of them were focused on, a uh, number of them were focused on uh, oversight and governance of the community working group. So again, 20, uh, 2018, we worked on that. At the beginning of 2019, adopted a new charter that provided that oversight and accountability. And it was like, okay, 2019, so now 2020, we'll, we'll work on the other thing, which is updating the code of conduct. Uh, and we sent out a survey and stuff, and then um, there was a global pandemic. So that kind of uh, kicked things a little bit uh, down, the, down the road. But in the meantime, we did create the community health team, and it was really fortuitous timing on that because uh, the, uh, <laughs> the community health was uh, in a pretty, uh, in a pretty rough space in 2020 because, you know, the aforementioned global pandemic. So uh, it was really good to have a group of people who, who really were passionate about um, helping the community. So 22, about almost exactly a year ago, uh, so they, the, uh, we started the process of uh, revising and adopting a revised community code of conduct. And so that's where I'm going to kind of start. Um, yeah, that was all prelude. Um, I told you I had a lot of stuff. Uh, so this was a seven-person group was assembled out of community health team members and, and conflict resolution team members. Um, and so um, that was myself, uh, Nikki Flores, um, who was kind of stepped away halfway through the process because she was elected to the Drupal Association board, became part of the review panel, therefore had kind of a little bit of conflict of interest. Uh, Julian Taylor from the UK, Jordana Fung, um, who's from Suriname and who leads up the uh, conflict resolution team, Mark Cassius, Donna Bungard, and Mike Anello, who also, along with myself, have been a longtime member of the conflict resolution team. So first thing we did, like every good group should do, is charter. Uh, we used Miro to do this, uh, uh, to basically define shared goals, measures of success, opportunities, and constraints. We did this through Miro. We did a bunch of stickies and uh, you know, organized and greeted them and voted on them. Um, and then once we kind of had that, the sort of what are we doing, why are we doing it, uh, and we then created a timeline. Uh, and because uh, we knew we needed to give ourselves that in order to make sure this thing actually happened. And uh, so we, we uh, had some key milestones. We had two week sprints. We started in June of 22, and we agreed that we were going to get to a place where we had a draft uh, by uh, mid-December of, of that year, so six-month process. Uh, and we knew we needed to let folks know what was happening, so we uh, posted public updates to Drupal Community Blog um, basically every two to four weeks to let folks know what was going on. Okay, so step one. Um, we knew that just that group of us was not gonna be enough. We were not going to successfully capture all the different perspectives of all the different folks in the community. We were coming in 
a lot of us with a lot of experience and a lot of perspective, but not necessarily the broader perspective of our entire uh, community. So uh, we created a list of groups and individuals who we wanted to make sure were involved, who we wanted to consult with during this. And so security working group, event organizers, Drupal diversity and inclusion, uh, we talked to some contributors, maintainers, we involved uh, Drupal Association staff members, uh, yeah, community accessibility. Uh, and then really this, this last part is really important because you, know, you look at that list before and we are largely folks from North America, the UK, uh, Jordan is from Suriname, which is in South America. Um, but we realized we needed a lot more non-United States, non-Western European perspectives. And so uh, we reached out to folks in um, uh, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, other places where um, we knew there were involved uh, community members who would be willing to kind of review what we were working on and you know, check and make sure we were being inclusive, including those perspectives. And uh, fortunately, we had already a great community health team um, who, um, who could help us with that. So then we, uh, we took a look. We're like, okay, so we have our code of conduct, uh, this, this, you know, this point 12-year-old Ubuntu code of conduct that we've been working with. Um, it's had a couple updates since. We took a look at that. Uh, the contributor covenant, very widely used, open source code of conduct, we looked at that. A uh, bunch of others up there. Um, we included not just open source projects, we include some kind of open source adjacent communities, uh, and Spiral is kind of an organization of folks who are involved with uh, self-organization. They have a really amazing handbook. And we just split them all up, divided them up, everyone took some and reviewed them. And, uh, and then we, we basically kind of broke them down into their different components, like what does this one have, what does this one have, what does this one have? And then we, we put all those on stickies, again, going back to Miro, and then we did this like really cool exercise where we, it was, uh, we voted on must have, should have, and nice to have uh, for our code of conduct. And uh, you know, it's, it's kind of small on the screen, but it was like, we agreed that we needed to have a statement of shared values, right? That there was a must have, for example, so it's in that center bullet, um, you know, incident report forms, things like that. And then around the edge, you have some of the, the nice to haves, uh, you know, things like getting into ideas of transformative justice and things like that. Um, things that we didn't feel were absolutely necessary, but that we, um, we thought were important. Um, so that's how we started to organize it. And then we, we created a Google Doc. And for each of those components of all the different codes of conduct, uh, we basically pulled the, the language the, from each of those codes, organized them in a Google Doc by the should haves, must haves, nice to haves, and and took that and we shared it out with that, that broader group of about two dozen community stakeholders for their review and feedback to see, okay, this is kind of where we're thinking this might go. Um, what do you think? And uh, so we got some really like great feedback, um, you know, using language that uh, was easier to read. This was particularly important uh, uh, for our folks who were um, outside, uh, you know, the US and UK and other English speaking countries that a lot of the language that is in these codes of conduct is really difficult to read, difficult, it's complex English. And, uh, and, if, and if English is not your first language, um, it, it takes a little bit more work to, to, to uh, translate it. Um, discussion of, a, a, there was so, one of the things we, we knew, we had gotten a lot of feedback during that 2017 process about the code of conduct and how it needed to be more specific, more actionable. Uh, and so there was a lot of discussion around sort of what those kind of examples should be of um, you know, what kind of behaviors uh, we wanted to promote, to encourage, to incentivize in the community and which kinds of behaviors um, you know, were, were not. <laughs> Um, and then uh, this was also, again, a really great place. I'm so glad we had this kind of, this, this group of community members because there were 
you know, words and phrases in some of these different um, codes of conduct that to someone like me seem perfectly innocuous, but, but if, if you're someone in a community of color, they read differently. Uh, so, you know, there's words, words around things like respectability and stuff like that, which um, it would really appreciate having those kind of flagged for us so we, we knew and suggestions for kind of alternate ways we could get the same, the same point across, uh, you know, without um, inadvertently saying something that, that might read uh, differently to someone else. So then, let's see, oh, there we are. This was the, uh, the big meat and potatoes part of it. This was, this was probably about four months worth of the six month project was revisions, revisions. Uh, we uh, adapted that outline that we created along with all the feedback into an initial draft. And uh, I really wanna thank Donna Bungard here. She did an amazing job of starting to pull that together. Um, and then we basically just continued to meet. Uh, we would review the draft, make additional edits, um, just keep going on this every, every two weeks to just to really kind of hone this down into something that was gonna be uh, clear and readable uh, for everyone. Um, yeah, Hemingway editor and readable, this was for me. I'm a person who likes to write. I like to use big words and complex sentences. Uh, so this was a very humbling experience uh, to try to communicate um, some pretty nuanced concepts using very simple, very direct language. And, uh, you know, because we knew that that was really important. And, you know, again, I talked about some of the other open source codes of conduct, you know, so the contributor covenant, right, which is one of the most widely used open source codes of conduct, it's actually written at a college graduate reading level. Um, and that is really challenging uh, to understand, um, even for people for whom English is their uh, native language. So we, we really were doing a lot of work to try to make things clear, shorten se short sentences, shorter words, um, but that still communicated the meaning. Uh, so then, then we got to a point where we finally like we're able to share, we had a draft that we felt comfortable sharing both with our, our stakeholder group and then the full community health team as well for additional review and suggestions. Um, so then, um, again, that was another round, another couple rounds of changes. Um, we finally got to a place where it's like, okay, I think we got something we can share with the community at large. And uh, so we created an issue on Drupal.org, as you do, uh, and to solicit feed along with the draft text to solicit feedback from the community. Um, this was something we did back in November of last year. Um, we also invited, as part of that, people to share feedback privately because we know, again, from experience, that there are certain things uh, that people may not feel safe saying publicly, um, but, but feedback that's very important. Uh, there, there might be people who, you know, who either are concerned they might be a target of harassment or who might have a piece of feedback that they want to deliver privately. So we uh, enabled people to do that. We wrote a blog post outlining why we were doing this, what changes we were looking for, the process to say the next steps, uh, threw it out on all the community channels, Slack, social media, it was in the Drupal newsletter. Um, and everything, trying to make sure as many folks knew about it as possible. Um, and as far as the issue discussion itself, like we didn't, we didn't want to wade into that. We didn't, we didn't get involved. We didn't share our opinion. Uh, we did answer clarifying questions. Um, so folks, um, you know, if folks were confused either about the process or what this thing was or that thing was, we let them know. Um, and then again, this is a really important thing that we've learned from uh, past is, is to time box that feedback period, right? Say, the, this is the period in which we are accepting feedback. We will lock the issue after that point uh, just to avoid things from spiraling or bike shedding out of control. So, I mean, in terms of the feedback we received, it was really interesting. And the, one of the big surprises for me was that um, 
we uh, actually didn't get a lot of feedback on the new language we were proposing, but we actually got a lot of feedback on, on the language that we didn't change, that, that, that had been there for 10 years. <laughs> and, you know, and people were like, uh, or 12 years, and people were like, yeah, I don't really like the way that's, that's worded or that doesn't make sense or that's you know, not, not consistent with my experience in the community. So that was, um, that was actually almost kind of a signal that maybe we needed to uh, uh, maybe even push things a little forward. So we, we did go into then another couple rounds of revision to incorporate that community feedback uh, and then uh, got that into a finalized draft. We did meet our deadline. Uh, we did get it finished uh, in December uh, and, uh, and then shared that finalized draft uh, with the conflict uh, resolution team. They shared it with the review panel. Um, as per the, the CWG's charter, the conflict resolution team is responsible for maintaining the code of conduct. So they're the ones um, you know, who are responsible uh, for, for reviewing and approving it. Um, but they did involve the, the review panel um, and there was, you know, there were some minor additional changes we made mostly around clarification, uh, around scope. Um, you know, that was a particularly tough nugget to crack. Um, and then uh, we, we created an, un, uh, an unpublished test page on Drupal.org to illustrate because as we'll see, I think over on the next slide, we, the new code of conduct um, has a different layout essentially than the current one. Um, and so we wanted to make sure it was like clear and people could scan it and everything. So um, then after all that, so May 30th, it was what, just over a week ago, we published and announced the uh, code of conduct. I'll, the URL for that will be on the following page if you want to look at that. But there's also blog posts that got published, posted out to Drupal Planet. I just got my weekly drop in my inbox today. I saw that it was promoted there. Uh, Dries has uh, posted about it on all of his socials. Um, he's got a pretty wide reach. And so, uh, you know, this is something that, that uh, folks should hopefully know about um, or be starting to know about. Um, and I uh, also have been speaking with folks at the, uh, at the Drupal Association about uh, how we can make sure that it gets a little bit of pr more promotion on Drupal.org as well. What we decided to do was to give folks essentially a month. Uh, so the new code of conduct, will, or the updated code of conduct, will take effect on July 1st. And at that point, it, there'll be a, like a little, if you log on to drupal.org after July 1st, there'll be a, like a little thing notifying people that the code of conduct has been updated with a link to check it out. Um, that will only appear the first time. It'll go away after that. Uh, and then we also made sure that everyone involved, we reached out to everyone to see if they were willing to uh, receive contribution credit. Um, we made sure that those uh, who did, did receive it. So, how am I doing on time? Got a few more minutes? Okay, thank you. Um, so what's new? What did we do? Um, overall, we preserved the structure um, and again, that's that's the URL down there. If you want to like look at it right now, that's uh, slash node slash three 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 nine five seven um, for the recording. Uh, but we really expanded out the um, the introduction, uh, the big introductory paragraph that really talks more about that lays the context that talks about Drupal's values and principles, how this uh, code of conduct relates to that. Uh, it, it goes into more detail about where the code of conduct applies, who it applies to, if you're interacting with other community members in different spaces. Um, and we really wanted to make sure we, we emphasized um, that Maintaining a, a welcoming community, this is, this is everyone's job. This is a shared responsibility. And uh, we wanted to make sure that was really clear and we actually put that in throughout. Um, we also put in a, a, a statement uh, to pledge welcoming and supporting people of 
uh, all backgrounds and identities. And you know, this is this is probably the one sentence that kind of like that kind of broke our readability editors, uh, readability software a little bit because uh, we again really we list um, to make it again very clear. And this is a best practice from other codes of conduct uh, to make it really clear um, that the different forms of discrimination that we um, we do not tolerate, right? And uh, and again, that was also a really great place where having a, a global audience review was important because there were a few things that, again, because most of these things were written from Western perspective that we missed. Uh, you know, discrimination by caste or tribal affiliation, for example. So we made sure those were included. Um, Talked about, yeah, uh, scope, enforcement expectations. Uh, we uh, have, a, you can see in the screenshot, we've got a little call out, very clear. So if you have an incident you need to report, this is how you do it. There's more detailed instructions in the document, but that we wanna make sure that was very easy for people to find and see, because very often when someone's reporting an incident, they don't wanna read the whole damn code of conduct. They just need to get make sure someone knows about their, their, their problem. So, uh, or the problem they've seen, right? Uh, so we, uh, we pulled that out. The, um, so again, I talked about, so shorter sentences, shorter paragraphs, easier to comprehend. We gave it a slightly more conversational, less formal tone. Uh, so that's the readability. And then the really the kind of big thing that's different is uh, these examples of a positive and unacceptable behaviors. And so we were really kind of struggling with this at first, because again, this was a, a piece of feedback from all the different surveys and conversations, everything that, that people, and even in some of the incidents that we had talked with people about, folks are like, well, I didn't know that that wasn't okay. And it's like, okay, well, you should have, but I guess maybe sometimes we do need to spell it out. So we spelled it out. Uh, and, uh, and, and, but if we included all of those like in the document, it'd be like a mile long. And again, we were looking for readability, scannability. So uh, the, these are actually presented on the page. Um, they're, they're kind of hidden fields. And so they're, they're collapsed by default, but you can expand them out uh, to, to get those examples. Those examples are not like essential parts of the text, but if you are looking for a better understanding of what this means in practice, you can uh, collapse those out. Um, yeah, so those are kind of the big, the big picture changes. Um, you know, again, you can look at the document yourself now. It is published, um, and uh, you know, review. Uh, if you've got a question or concern, there's file an issue or reach out directly. Um, you know, uh, again, it, this is this is this is not perfect. Uh, nothing is, but but we think we 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 think we got it, <laughs> and uh, but we still have uh, a couple weeks if there's like some typo or language uh, thing that needs to be changed. Um, so yeah, what have we learned? This has been quite a process. Um, so for anyone who's looking to do something like this, um, so again. This is for me, a really helpful, important setting a goal and milestones early. Uh, don't be afraid to make changes. We realized that you know we had a plan and our, our first plan did not include enough rounds of revision. So we, we tweaked there, but we were able to do it in a way that preserved the overall schedule. Um, inviting a diverse group of people uh, early on to review the draft uh, can catch many issues. This was a big lesson that I, that we learned, um, I learned uh, going back 11 years when we did the, uh, the event code of conduct. Uh, we did have a group of uh, folks, but it didn't, it didn't have any European representation. And when we published it, um, you know, I published it, I think at the end of the day, US time, and, and, I, and I woke up the next morning, my inbox was flooded with a lot of feedback from folks in Europe, and it's like, okay, not gonna make that mistake again. I'm gonna include them from the start. 
Uh, and so, yeah, so we, we did, uh, you know, and, 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 and these folks, um, very, very grateful to this essential part of the process. Uh, as I said before, a lot of popular codes of conduct are written using really complex language. This is kind of like a, a bit of feedback for us at open source in general. We often get very technical, and that also means we sometimes get very technical in our, in our community language. And um, yeah, and we should really be mindful of that because it, it can make our communities feel a little less welcoming. Um, and again, allowing people to contribute privately and anonymously. Uh, so we, we had a couple pieces of uh, really great anonymous feedback. We had some less constructive pieces of anonymous feedback, but uh, we, we accepted it. And you know, you know we, we, it was good to hear. And, I, and going back actually to that community review process, um, you know, there, there were a lot of suggestions um, we incorporated, I was really grateful, I saw uh, Ryan's Rama, uh, who uh, tweeted or LinkedIn posted uh, that, uh, you know, because he had participated in the, uh, in, the, in the open discussion in the issue queue, and he said uh, that he really appreciated that we did incorporate some of his feedback, but we didn't incorporate all of it, <laughs> and that, 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 that helped him feel comfortable that this community review was not just paying lip service, that we really were listening. Um, so um, even, if, even if he didn't get all the things he wanted. So, um, and then, yeah, um, these things take time. And, you know, there, there was a big part of me that was for a while, I was like, well, I, I, I could probably just go and bang out this code of conduct over a weekend. Um, you know, chat GPT wasn't available when we were doing this, but I was like, I actually ran this through chat GPT and was pleasantly surprised uh, at how well it, 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 it accepted it. Um, you know, but that's, that's not going to capture the, the, the human feedback and the unique kind of human fingerprint of our community, right? Um, you know, so I think there's, there's very often a, a temptation in open source. It's like, okay, well, we'll just adopt whatever, you know, code of conduct is out there. Uh, and, uh, and that's fine, but we are such a broad community, broad, diverse, global community, and a one-size-fits-all approach does not work for us. So, um, and getting to that place, though, where we have something that uh, does takes time. So. I have any, speaking of time, uh, if I have any left. Oh, great, five minutes for questions, thank you. <laughs> um, and yeah, and that's where to find me. I'm, I'm not on Twitter anymore, but I'm on the, the Mastodons and the LinkedIn's. Any questions? That was a lot of talking I just did. Yes. You know, we haven't decided on the wording yet. Um, the, sorry, yes, for the recording. Uh, the question was when the, uh, when the, the little announcement box shows up on drupal.org uh, at the beginning of July, uh, will, with the, you know, we've updated our code of conduct, will that include a little TLDR of the changes? And I was just saying, we haven't picked the wording yet. I don't know how much space we'll have to work with. Um, so this is a conversation we'll be having with, with Neil Drum and the technical team, Tim Lennon um, as well. And um, at the very least, I think we'll link to a summary of the changes uh, so folks know, um, but, um, but I don't know how much text we'll be able to squeeze in there. Uh, and then, did you have a question? No, someone, I thought I saw another hand somewhere. Corey. So Corey's question is, what is the most surprising part of the process for me? Uh, so for me personally, it was, um, it really was the thing around the complex language. And uh, so I, I actually, this this has kind of set me down a little path. I, I have, uh, I have realized that um, I am good at writing words. <laughs> 
I'm not always good at writing words that are easy for other people to understand. Uh, and, uh, and, and that, that it is, it was, this was a, such a humbling process because I, there are some very complex, particularly when it comes to scope and enforcement of a code of conduct, you know, uh, like what kind of context would like, you know, for example, like, uh, we will, if, if a community member starts harassing another community member over social media, the social media platform is not itself something that's owned by the community. It's an interaction between two community members, right? And that kind of harassment is absolutely something we can and should be within the scope of our code of conduct to take action on. We can't just be like, oh, well, it was on Twitter, so it doesn't doesn't apply. That that's absurd, right? Uh, and and so, but figuring out how to communicate that using simple, clear, direct language. That that was what we were we were still revising on that one up until the the very very end. And uh, so, yeah. Um, so I now have a much greater appreciation for what they call it, plain language or clear language. It's, it's a thing, and I, I wrote a little personal blog or post for my company blog about how it's like really part of accessibility, right? Like we, we think about accessibility and how it, uh, you know, we think about like, oh, you know, are the, is, is use the font stand out about the background and everything, but like if the words themselves are not accessible, then like it doesn't matter how good your contrast ratio is. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So um, now that you've done the big overhaul, yeah. Recently, what's the plan going forward? Like, how often do you keep doing it? Well, I mean, hopefully it won't be me uh, doing it. <laughs> um, I really want this to be something, um, you know, and I'm 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 going to talk with the folks on the uh, on the. Um, both the conflict resolution and the community health team. Because we have now these examples that are in there, um, I really think this is something we should be at least looking at uh, once a year, um, you know, and we don't necessarily need to make revisions every year, but we should at least be reviewing and, you know, seeing if there are new kinds of issues that are coming up. So, I mean, a great example would be um, an issue we have a lot right now that's a very hot issue is uh, uh, people uh, gaming the contribution credit system, right? And that is something that, like, didn't exist 10 years ago, and, and you know, so we wouldn't have even thought to have included it. Um, Actually, when we had our original code of conduct, like social media wasn't even a thing, right? So, and now it is like the number one vector of harassment. So, uh, so I think you do have to review. Um, you don't want this to be an ossified document, and so I am. Uh, I'm hoping we can establish at least an annual uh, sort of cadence for reviewing uh, and making changes if needed. Thank you. Yes. Just up. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I am, I'm happy. I, I've, I've had actually a few conversations uh, over Drupalcon over the last few days about how we can be better and clearer with our marketing, not just in Drupal, but, but in open source, right? And again, I think this goes to the fact that so many of us are highly technical experts, right? And when we, when we think about things and communicate things, we use very precise, very technical language. I get that, that makes sense, it's very natural. Uh, it is, but not everyone in our community and not everyone in the world uh, processes language like that. And so we need to make sure that we're being inclusive in terms of how we talk about what we do, whether that's for documentation, 
Um, I think the documentation folks have been well down this path already, uh, and so I'm very grateful for that. Um, but I think you're absolutely correct that in terms of our, our marketing and our community communication, there's there's a lot of room for improvement, um, and I think that goes. I think that's true for open source in general, not just our our little our little project here. So thank you. Thank yeah. You, sir. There you go. Like that. Thank you.